I call the City Council meeting to order on uh, Tuesday, July 21st at 7 o'clock. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, welcome. My name is Ann Hunt. I am the mayor. To my left is Mark Vanderlindy, Arlene Donahue, Bob Christians, and Tyler Evans, my fellow council members. And on the end is Paul uh, Hornby from WSB, our city engineer. To my right is Mike Baroni, our interim city administrator, uh, Brian Grimm, our finance director, David Abel, our community uh, services director, and I'm blanking. Sarah Sansala with Kennedy Sarah Engraving. Sarah Sansala from Kennedy Engraving. Paul uh, Falls from, is our uh, Director of Public Safety. Sorry about that, Sarah. Um, and the first item is the approval of agenda. And what we'd like to do is just flip our um, persons to be heard with our, uh, um, with our special presentation by our uh, new superintendent, Mr. Patrick Devine. Is everybody okay with that? You bet. Yes. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, do we have a second? I guess we're I second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Five oh. Sorry, I'm moving too fast. Okay, so um, welcome, Mr. Devine, and we're happy to meet you. Thank you. Here Mayor, City home. Council members, all the city officials, thanks for having me here. My name is Pat Devine, I'm the new superintendent at Waconia Schools, ISD 110. Um, I've kind of started a new theme in our school district where I've been doing a lot of publications saying we are 110 and, and mm -hmm. uh, we spell out the, the one as in O and E 10 so that everybody knows we're all one. Um, and the, the, my purpose of that is I really feel that we are 110. It's, it doesn't matter if you're Manitresta, St. Bonnie, Victoria, New Germany, or Waconia, you're all part of the school district and we all want to be, feel like we're a part of that school district. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. Um, and I just came here uh, for a couple of reasons, just for you to get to know me, um, both uh, professionally, a little bit personally, and then uh, um, be able to continue a relationship so that if there's some things that are going on in the school that you want to know about, we can, we can talk about that. Or if there's things going on in Minatrista that we want to have some shared cooperative uh, things going on, we'd, we'd be able to have that communication with you. Um, but just a little bit on Pat Devine. Um, it's my 31st year in education. Um, started out way back in... Uh, Moorcroft, Wyoming. Um, the reason I was there is I finished out at Black Hill State uh, with a math and computer science degree. So taught there four years and my wife and I knew we wanted to get into Minnesota because she's from Bemidji. I'm from Southeast South Dakota and we knew that we wanted to get uh, somewhere in Minnesota and we ended up in Litchfield for 26 years. Taught and coached there um, and then I became a middle school principal 16 years ago. Did that for 16 years but the last five, I was doing dual duties. Um, for three of those five, I was middle school and high school principal. Uh, it was a one-year deal to save some money. One, two, three years. <laughs> I was so I uh, ended up working out pretty good, I guess, um, and then uh, turned it into uh, middle school principal and assistant superintendent, where I was in charge of uh, curriculum, staff development, and tech initiatives. Um, that kind of set me up to be uh, prepared for the Waconia superintendent position. Um, our youngest uh, son had just graduated uh, from St. John's this uh, spring. Mike, I heard you have one of those. <laughs> He's got a couple more years to go. Um, yeah, there you go. Um, but uh, uh, once that happened, my wife and I looked in, at each other and said, you know, maybe a new chapter in our life. Let's look at some superintendent positions. And when Waconia School System opened up, we said, now that's a, that's a school that we would go to to pull us out of Litchfield. Uh, we've been there 26 years and we wanted to make sure that was something that we really wanted to go to. And once Wilconia was there and had that opportunity, um, we definitely said that's something we would choose. Um, so when this all played out, we, were, we couldn't be happier. Um, and talk a little bit about my wife. My wife is 31 years. Uh, she's, um, she uh, um, worked in the school system as a paraprofessional, but she also is a violinist and she teaches uh, violin lessons. So mm -hmm. she'll probably be doing that when she we move. Uh, we look like we're going to get here in the next month. Um, we have a spot in Waconia that we found in um, downscale and into a townhome. Mm -hmm. But um, we have three children um, and uh, two grandsons. 
Our oldest son has two sons. He, he's, our oldest son is an art teacher up in Pillager, next to Baxter Brainerd area. And uh, he's married to, he's an art teacher and she's a math teacher, his wife's a math teacher. Just, uh, um, and then our middle daughter, she is a, uh, um, uh, she works in um, advertising and she lives out in Brooklyn and, and works right in Manhattan, New York City, and seems to like that life. And, um, and then our youngest son just graduated from St. John. So that's a little bit about Pat Devine, both personally and professionally. But um, I think the, the main thing that I guess I would want to come here for is just to, to put a face to a name. You might have heard that there was a new superintendent in, in uh, ISD 110. Um, and that would be who I am. <laughs> um, and uh, just to let you know that uh, one of the things that, and I've told this, we had a big workshop week last week and I presented to all the staff just kind of my feelings and my beliefs and philosophies and one of my deep philosophies is that everybody feels valued no matter if you're an employer or if you're a student and, and I feel that very strong inside always and so if there's ever a time when uh, some students from Minnetrist aren't feeling that I need to know that because that's very important and everybody feels valued. Um, so, um, we have a few initiatives that are going on in our district. One is uh, obviously a referendum that we're coming up with here in this fall, and I know um, we're scheduling another meeting to come back and talk in more detail about that, but um, that one's uh, starting to ramp up and it's pretty exciting, and uh, we're pretty fired up for that to happen, but uh, we'll let you know more about that on a, on a longer conversation, I guess. <laughs> But I know you have other business to take care of. I just kind of want to come here and introduce myself and uh, talk a little bit with you and let you know who I am. Mm -hmm. But uh, any questions for you that, of me? Any questions? Um, just, just, just a comment. My yeah. ninth grade daughter informed me today that school was boring. Okay. So, so I said, well, then you must need more homework. She says, no, that would really be boring. <laughs> <laughs> So, that's that first day blues, right? right yeah. Grade. Well, she's ninth grade, so now she's in high school. Yeah. So this is all the rules and regulations and all that. Yes. And that's yeah. all that. I just have one comment I'd like to make, and that's sure, good luck. Well. Good, good luck Friday night wearing a Wildcats jersey <laughs> when Waconia plays Litchfield in their football game. So that'll be interesting coming from Litchfield. So make sure you wear all that Wildcat jersey. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be really interesting because I live literally a block and a half from, from the stadium. Uh, I can see the stadium from our backyard. Um, and so I know my friends from Litchfield are just going to cringe when I wear all the purple. <laughs> you know, they're going to be like, are you kidding me? But um, that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> They'll have to deal with it. And uh, I do think uh, the Dragons are going to need some luck because the Wildcats look pretty good this year. And mm -hmm. Sam Baker's doing a nice job with the, with the players. So it should be a fun year. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank, hey, you. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, and I look forward to coming back. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on to persons to be heard. And I'm again going to go over what that means. Uh, the city council invites residents to share new ideas or concerns related to city business. However, individual questions or remarks are limited to three minutes per speaker. No city council action will be taken, although the council may refer issues to staff for follow up or consideration at a future meeting. The mayor may use discretion if speakers are repeating views already expressed or ask for a, spokesman, a spokesperson for groups of individuals with similar views. Speakers should state their name and home address at the podium before speaking. We have Patricia Thole first. Madam Mayor, Councilors, I'm Patricia Thole. I live at 5900 Loring Drive, and uh, I feel I should disclose I currently serve on the Planning Commission and am running for City Council. Uh, prior to this evening, I didn't plan on speaking, but uh, something occurred that I, I feel I need to address. Um, I arrived at 5.30 tonight for the special city council meeting, and at 5.28, upon my arrival, Mayor Hunt called me up to the mayor's desk with all of the council members, city engineer, city staff, and chief falls present, and accused me of having a statement in relation to the water treatment facility on my campaign website that I do not. She then said it was on the Minot Our Minotrista website. Although I am endorsed by Our Minotrista, I informed her that my website is patriciatholeforcouncil.com and that she is welcome to check out my website, although it is not fully complete yet. 
Mayor Hunt says she has some information on the water treatment facility and I told her I would be happy to take a look at it. I am not opposed to talk to Mayor Hunt or any of the council members on a one-on-one -on -one basis in an appropriate setting. Um, however, I think it was inappropriate for the mayor of Minnetrista to call me up out of the audience and accuse me of having a statement on my cam we campaign website that I do not. When I was applying to serve on the planning commission, I met with uh, you, Mayor Hunt, who at the time was a counselor, Councilor Vanderlindy, Councilor Christians, and uh, former Mayor Cheryl Fisher. I did not wi meet with Councilor Donahue because I called and left two voice messages but never received a call back. Um, I also never met with Councilor Evans be because he had not yet been selected to serve. I would be happy to meet with any of you in an appropriate setting. As a resident of Minnetrista, I have a right I have a right to and have chosen to subject myself to the election process because I sincerely want to serve on the city council and feel that Minnetrista would be well served by my skills and experience. My intent from the beginning has been to run a positive campaign, not a negative campaign. It would be my suggestion that at a minimum going forward, that no other resident be called up in front of the council and mayor and be inaccurately and inappropriate accused of something they didn't do. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And I would like to clarify that not the entire council was here and I was providing information. There were no accusations. And your picture the, is the on the entire council website. was here. No, he wasn't here. Uh, I wasn't here. No, when was, was that? When did you do this? This when is was before the. Um, it was at meeting. 528. Oh, when I was. Was I here? I didn't see anything. Yeah, well, Whatever. You may want to remove your um, endorsement from that website if you don't support the statements that are made on it and if you don't need clarification of that information. Okay, Jerry Wigan. Oh, did you want to? I think the, I'm looking for the rules of the uh, persons to be heard. It's at my and discretion. It says no council action will be taken during this meeting. We're not taking so. an action. We're making a comment. Jerry? My name is Jerry Wigan. I live at 6841 Cardinal Cove Drive. I've been a Minnetrista resident for 26 years. For the past six months, citizens have listened to a former Minnetrista police chief, resident, and now Champlin police chief, David Kolb, stand here and verbally attack council members and citizens, myself included. He has even brought in non-residents to speak and fill the council chambers for the appearance of larger crowds. All of the Colt Take Back Minnetrista 411 Committee's accusations have been proven to be false and without any merit or validity. Meanwhile, Colb himself and his followers have been caught in numerous lies while making these accusations. His credibility and character of that of several of his committees will be exposed to residents in the future. The city has spent thousands of tax dollars to comply with the data information requests that the Kolb Group has initiated. They are attempting to prove this council has violated laws governing a quorum. Not surprising, no such violations have been uncovered. Kolb has put together his own slate of candidates for the 2014 election. They include ousted 2009 council member Lisa Whalen for mayor, his neighbor Pamela Mortensen, and friend Patricia Thole for council. Mayor Hunt and council members should be commended for allowing non-residents of the 411 group to even speak at our council meeting. This is a sharp contrast to the cold 2014 mayoral candidate Lisa Whalen's vote on the 2009 city council to eliminate the citizens to be heard portion of the city council meetings. She stated on her 2010, this copy of her 2010 
election campaign literature that she removed the citizens to be heard because it provided a forum for opponents to promote their agenda. Yet she was recently, has recently been seen in council chambers supporting the 411 committee's efforts to promote their agenda. You can't have it both ways, Ms. Whalen. The 411 group repeatedly attacked the city council on the issue of the water treatment plant. However, just as the council had promised all along, they allowed the voters to decide this issue. The Cove group was shocked that the citizens were allowed to decide this issue. They have had no rebuttal. This also is in sharp contrast to their mayoral candidate, Lisa Whalen, 2009 council that denied voters their right to decide the issue of the new police building. Even though her council was presented with nearly 1,000 petition signatures, requesting that right. In her 2010 campaign literature, she stated her vote was based on fact, on the fact that she really knew more than the voters. Really? Lisa Whalen spearheaded the effort to build the new police station facility. She then boasted about the size of the facility, same as Eden Prairie, population 64,000 people. She stated our facility would be built for a city of 50,000 people. Ms. Whalen, based on your projected growth rate, it will take 207 years to, to achieve that goal. I'm sure residents are comforted in knowing that this issue has been put to bed for the next two plus centuries. Because of your lack of foresight, Ms. Whalen, residents are not comforted in knowing your new facility will cost them $400,000 per year for 20 years 10% of our entire city budget. Ms. Whalen's thirst for spending can be traced back to her days on the 2007 City Council and prior. The Star Tribune article, I'm, I'm going to uh, mention a little later, Lisa, that, or that uh, Ann, that I would like to have some additional time because of the fact that my name was brought into the article. And I can go right to you that You can right address now. your part. We gave Ralph Harrison seven and a half minutes at the last meeting, so I'll let you address what's relevant okay. to you. I'll skip over some of this, even though it was important information. Uh, recently, residents have received this flyer. I will move it up. In their newspaper drop, whoop, not that one. this flyer in their newspaper drop boxes. It was delivered by the Cold 411 Take Back Minnetrista Committee because false and untruthful information was provided to the Star Tribune by the Cold Group involving my name. I have asked <sighs> Mayor Hunt for additional time to respond. The Star Tribune has agreed to a follow-up clarification. I was suspicious of the 411 committee statement on this flyer that stated reprint with, reprinted with position, uh, permission of the Star Tribune. I emailed Ms. Pamela Miller, senior West Metro team leader from the Star Tribune, asking her if this statement was correct. I have the copies of the emails here. 23 minutes later, I received her response. Jerry, permission was not granted to make political flyers. We're looking into this. So much for David Cole's credibility. The next day, she emailed me the following email. We have spoken with Champlain Police Chief David Cole and told him not to distribute copies of the Star Tribune article in their campaign literature for political purposes, informing him that to do so is a violation of their reprint policy as posted on their website and a violation of U.S. copyright laws. However, the Cold 411 Committee has evidently chosen to ignore this warning and has posted a link to the reprint of their article on the 411, on their 411 website. I asked David Kolb, what part of do not reprint Star Tribune articles for political purposes do you not understand? It's straightforward. 
Do David Kolb's actions really surprise anyone? We know his background as a liar while the chief of police in Minnetrista. Let's look at his reputation as champion of police. Uh, we, Jerry, let's just, uh, I yeah. think it's gone over. We, we need to stop. Okay. okay. Tom? Hello, I'm Tom Dodge, 1250 Morning View Drive. And again, wanted to come here and thank all of you for the good job you're doing. I like Jerry, I got one of these delivered in my box as well. And I'm not sure who did it. Maybe he's one of my neighbors, I don't know. But at any rate, I just wanted to point out in here, and it seems like the one thing this group, and they've got a lot of things that aren't truthful here, obviously. Uh, but the one thing they really seem to be hanging their hat on uh, is that basically it says, um, Vander Lindy, Donahue, and Abbins all ignored residents' requests to reconsider the original $5 million proposal and vote to approve the $16 million project. I want to make people here aware there is no $5 million viable option. I've been a civil engineer, I've had my own company for 31 years, graduated tops in my class in structural engineering from Marquette University, and I looked through all this stuff. And basically what the $5 million proposal included was two water treatment plants, only sized for a two to a three year outlook window. That's it. We've got three water systems in our city. This would only have addressed two of them. It's not doing anything to interconnect the systems at all. Uh, it, it was a terrible solution. And even WSB, by their own financial numbers, uh, came up with that the central system made more sense. Yet, for whatever reason, they recommended this decentralized system. I suspect this that they felt that they didn't want to shock us with the high price, is all I can figure out. Um, but like I say, the way you went is correct. Uh, I think it should have, I would have been happier if it was RO. I would have connected then, I'm not going to now. Uh, but I know you did the right thing. You tried listening to the people. Unfortunately, there were, was information out. Again, one of my neighbors put a thing in there just prior to the election. The, the Lakers shouldn't have published it but was full of untruthful information and facts. They quoted facts, but they weren't facts. So at any rate, had, the, had this article not been in there, we probably would be looking at our old system. I'm sad that we don't have that that we're looking at, but I applaud you for listening to the public. That's a breath of fresh air. And one thing too on this, your, or, or, was it our Minitrist or your Minitrist website, uh, basically they're saying that a year has been squandered. A year hasn't been squandered. If you guys went ahead with the original plan that WSB had, we'd be going ahead with a plan with two small decentralized plants, not doing any interconnecting, which should have been done decades probably ago, okay? And we'd be stuck with that. And that was a system that was steel tanks. It's not one to easily add on to the capacity. So God bless you. And if anything was squandered, we've squandered probably eight, 10 years away under the old leadership of Cheryl Fisher, George Zanenko, and Lisa Whalen when they went ahead with the police facility that benefited a few employees of Minatrista instead of this water treatment facility that benefits all the residents that are on city water. And thank you and God bless you all. Thanks, Tom. Okay, next item is our consent agenda. Does anybody have any changes? There was, um, in the minutes, there was, I'm trying to scroll down to it, I've got it highlighted. One of the motions didn't have anything by it. It's uh, the final sale of the bonds. On the video, it was Hunt said so move, and I believe Vander Lindy seconded it. So. Yes, you have the 5 0 in there. It was just blank on the motion and second. Um, I'd like to pull item D. Okay. Okay, so the approving roundabout agreement for MINDA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other changes? Mm -hmm. Okay, can I get a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented with changes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye. it's 5 0. And then uh, do you want to, should we address D now? Sure. Okay, approving roundabout agreement with MINDOT. Um, it's, it's 
actually more kind of a comment or information. Um, I had looked at it. What was concerning me was the, you know, the maintenance of this thing. So I got a hold of Mark Erickson this afternoon, the, the engineer from WSB, and he informed me that the maintenance was going to go along with um, Woodland Cove. So we, we're not going to be on the hook for doing maintenance because it's, it is, it, it'll, it'll be beautiful. It's pretty extravagant landscape. And mm -hmm. what I did, didn't want to happen is have our, you know, city workers out there weeding, you know, this, this extravagant garden. So, um, but we're not on the hook for it. No, he informed yeah. me that the maintenance is going to be strictly, and I think David can confirm that. Correct. Right? Correct. Okay. That's all I that I've got. Okay, so do you want to do you want to approve that then now? I'll make a motion to approve item D in the consent agenda. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five all. Okay, our next item is the public hearing for the reclassification of EDA bonds. Yeah. This is Brian. Yep, this is Brian. Okay, Madam Mayor and members from the council, we have uh, Mark Ruff from our. Uh, Ellers and Associates here tonight to uh, talk about this. There's actually um, this item is in your packet on you see your pages uh, 35 through 67. It's actually uh, two parts. The first part is to approve the attached um, capital improvement plan and provide the preliminary approval for the issuance of bonds there under. And that's just that's the process to make these um, capital improvement bonds or CIP bonds. And uh, the second part then, if the council so chooses, is to uh, have a, the re resolution to um, approve for the uh, the pre-sale after there's there's a 30-day window that we have to uh, to wait, and I'm setting that for October 6th. But I'll let um, Mark speak about the specifics of the uh, report, or at least some of the highlights on the potential uh, savings, and then maybe after uh, Mark speaks, then we maybe would open up the public hearing and then okay. go from there for the resolutions. The council so chooses. So. Madam Mayor and members of the Council, I'm Mark Ruff with Ellers. Todd Hagen is your primary contact with Ellers but was out of town this evening. Uh, the meeting tonight and the public hearing is to take comments on this capital improvement plan. It's a special capital improvement plan related to Chapter 475 in the Minnesota statutes that allows cities to issue general obligation bonds for city halls, public safety, public works, libraries. Uh, if there is a public hearing and then the City Council waits for 30 days to see if there is a reverse referendum. Reverse referendum is a term for a petition process for, in this case, 5% of voters in the last election, an amount equal to 5% to bring in a petition and put the, uh, this particular bond issue on the ballot. Uh, the primary purpose of this statute is for new construction, and so a lot of the language that you see in this plan addresses factors about whether or not you've looked at other alternatives for facilities. Obviously, this facility is up and running. Uh, this is a refinancing situation. The existing bonds were lease revenue bonds. They're subject to annual appropriation of the city council. By utilizing the statute, you can then attach a general obligation and get you much lower interest rates. The interest rates on the bonds that were issued in 2009 are about 4.4%. With today's very low interest rates, we expect interest rates um, to be somewhere between 25 and 2.75. So over 1.75% drop in interest rates. Uh, the good news out of that is you have savings. Even after all costs, the savings are estimated to be $25,000 per year. Uh, and uh, that totals over the life of this issue uh, over $440,000. So. Those are direct savings that you would realize, um, assuming that interest rates stay uh, about the same for the next month. Uh, after the 30 days, you can formally sell these bonds. We do have that scheduled if you so choose to move forward as a city council this evening for your first meeting in October. Um, so that is kind of a general overview of the bonds and the CIP process. Uh, if you choose not to move forward with the bond sale in October, but still approve the CIP plan. It does give you the authority to come back later on, whether it's three months or six months at a time when you feel like interest rates are such that you're going to achieve the goals of the savings that you as a city are looking for. Uh, and certainly we will monitor the market and keep staff informed of what's happening with the market over the next month. You don't need to make that decision tonight. You could make that decision in October if you so chose. Um, the um, 
you know, I, with refinancing, it all sounds like good news. In fact, some, one time I was at a city council meeting and somebody from the audience yelled, well, there's got to be a downside, right? I mean, every decision has a downside. And I would say the only two reasons for not moving forward with the refinancing at this point in time would be, number one, if you somehow wanted to use cash to pay off all or a portion of these bonds over the next nine years, remember that the refinancing will extend the period of the lockout. So most municipal bonds can't be prepaid like a mortgage at any point in time. Uh, right now, these bonds are prepayable in 2017, and we'll put the money in escrow and um, they'll be paid off in 2017. With the new bonds, that prepayment lockout would go until 2024. Okay, so you have nine years of these bonds. So that's one reason if you didn't want to move forward and you wanted to pay cash off, one reason not to. Um, the other is, is if you believe that somehow interest rates are going to stay the same um, over the next two years, then it would be a better idea to wait and do the refinancing in two years. You'd save slightly more money. Obviously, none of us can predict the future. That's a determination for all of you. But those are certainly the two reasons that I could come up with why you wouldn't want to do, move forward with this. All I can say is that right now, interest rates certainly are at historic lows. and. Um, I think everyone's been waiting for interest rates to go up over the last couple of years, and it just hasn't happened, but that's the expectation that I hear, but it's really your determination um, on the timing of that particular issue. I think that's a general overview. Um, the be happy to answer any specific questions either after the public hearing or before. I have a quick question. Um, right now we're saying it's going to save us about 20,000 years. So if we waited two years to refinance, we would still have paid 40,000 that we wouldn't have. The whole interest cost of going the EDA route originally, rather than a a, um, a GO bond, which would have required a referendum, has cost the city about eight hundred thousand dollars in interest costs. So by refinancing it, we're removing about half of it. Correct. Um, waiting two years, I'm not sure that that even if interest rates stayed the same, it, risking that probably doesn't make sense. It's again not a recommendation. It is simply just you. You know, we feel like it's our job to provide options right. for you. You can evaluate those options, and certainly would not disagree with your assessment. I'm just trying to work this through because, mm -hmm. as it is, you know, we still gave away four hundred thousand by not going through a referendum, in my opinion. Um, but this way, at least, we're we're saving about half of that eight hundred thousand by refinancing. Mm -hmm. If we wait two years, what what will be our savings? Say the interest rate stayed exactly the same. Um, if it stayed exactly the same, your interest savings would be around $590,000. Yeah, with the negative arbitrage was, yeah, about $130,000, $150,000. So, yeah, but the rates would have to stay, like Mark said, exactly the same. Right. 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 But you're also still paying $20,000 so. more. <clears throat> yeah, so you have to really back off $40,000. Right, is that Because you're not also. recognizing those savings. Is that including paying the higher rate for the next two years? It does. It does. Yes. So it'd be about 150. Okay. So mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you, that's been netted out, I think. Oh, so it has. Okay. It, that it, was my question. But to your point, yeah, it, it, yeah, I mean, if we think, I think at some point we think rates are going to go up. So it's, yeah, when, how much are you willing to, right. to gamble yeah, waiting those next gamble. couple of years? Yeah. Well, yeah, just, just curious when you said it would be cheaper to wait. I was curious how If the interest rates are the same. Yeah, as long as they Assuming. Stay the same. Right. That. Yeah. So two questions I have. Number one. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, number one uh, on your plan here, you have approximately five million one hundred ninety-five thousand uh, regarding the public safety or the police building and the public works. So, are you using that number because is that basically the balance owed on the police station and the public works building? Five million one hundred ninety-five thousand. Number one. Number two. If we go ahead and proceed this. Will it lower our annual debt service to 400000 a year? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll take the first, uh, the second question first. Okay. Um, the $5,195,000, i am assuming, is the balance still owed on the police station? Well, it's a little more complicated than that, but I'll, I'll, get, to the, okay. um, I'll get to the issue of uh, the savings. So I, I, I mentioned it earlier that the savings would be 25000 plus or minus, actually a little bit so more than that. For years, it'd be... 370 to 375,000 instead of 400,000. Those savings would start right away. You don't have to wait the two years, as the mayor said, for that savings to start. Um, the second question is 
right now the outstanding balance of um, principal is four million seven hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Okay, um, and then you have interest cost on top of that between now and the call date. Okay, so that uh, total is is over five point one million dollars, but you have some interest earnings that are going to offset that. Okay, and so it's the net that's required to pay off the principal and the interest for the next two years is the $5.1 million figure that you mentioned. Okay. Now, I, I got lost on something here. You're, you mentioned that if we, at that time when this was done, had it been a referendum, I, I, I you explain it's a different the 800000 to the 400000 Why did it cost us 400000 more? Because we never have a referendum. No, it was 800000 more because um, a general obligation bond has lower interest rates than an EDA bond. An EDA bond is, is a different type of financing. And that because they didn't go through the referendum process and they went the EDA route, they had higher interest rate. Do you want to explain it in more detail? I'm probably not explaining it as well. But it's a different type of bond. So I think the... I I wasn't involved in the calculations in your 800,000, but the concept- It that came from LRC. Yeah, I, I'm sure that Todd had discussed that with you. The concept is that lease revenue bonds, it's a very common form of financing, but it does carry a higher interest rate because you potentially as a city could walk away from that obligation. City of Badness Heights walked away from a recreational facility in the last two years and that has in addition, you probably would be paying more in interest today if you sold these bonds as lease revenue than back in 2009. But because those interest rates are anywhere from, depends on the city and the time, a quarter percent to a half percent or even three quarter percent higher, then I think that's what the mayor is referring to over the first six years of this financing, which is mostly interest cost, that higher interest rate. Um, brought you higher interest costs during those first several years. So by refinancing to a general obligation, we're eliminating that option for you to walk away from this facility in exchange for lower interest rates. So you, had it been a referendum, it would have been 800,000 less. Correct. Wow. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? So at this point, should we do the resolution? No, I think we'd want to probably open up the public oh, hearing okay. and then see if anyone wants you have to that talk. first. Okay. Yeah. I now open the public hearing oh. regarding the reclassifying of the 2009 EDA lease revenue bonds to capital improvement bonds. Anybody want to say anything? Nobody? And I think, yeah, I guess, and then if anyone has any comments on the attached capital improvement plan, I think it's sort of the, uh, the, the secondary part of. So it's okay. actually two public hearings. Oh, um, I think it's all can be one public okay. hearing, but basically. Or do, does anybody have any comments on the uh, capital improvement plan? No comments. I hereby close this meeting, and now I'll entertain a motion for the resolution. Yes. So the I have one comment on this. So if I could add one more comment, and that is that. Uh, Again, it's how things are perceived. It's important to explain that this is a refinance and that we're just not the city and we're taking out another $5 million bond. We're taking out right. to pay off a debt that's already occurred, that's already right. sitting there. A savings so it's maybe, we have to make sure that that, that is communicated uh, correctly. Correct. Yeah, and the logistics of it, I, and maybe Mark can correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I think we'll have a, the uh, the ask. We'll have to see, whether it be the two issues out there for a little bit until the call date. So that's so until 2017. But there'll be the escrow that'll take care of that. And then, but we will realize net savings after all this is done is that I think yeah. I mean, four hundred thousand. Yeah, but huge. roughly four hundred thousand. So yeah, I mean, it, it's yeah, twenty five thousand plus a year over the next. Well, you season. understand what I'm saying. We don't need we don't need to have something printed that says we're taking out another a $5 million bond, yes, we're converting it to save money and paying off old debt. Correct, yeah, this is just similar to the refunding we did earlier this right. month mm -hmm. or whatever to refund the one street project and the one water bond. Yeah, this, we, this is no, um, 
additional debt to finance a new project or anything to that effect. Correct. Uh, it's it's no different than refinancing your house. Correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. That's yeah, what we're just doing. taking advantage of the historically right. low interest rates. That's what right. we're doing. And right. you just have to present it clearly. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? So yeah. So then I think what we have attached in the packet there's two resolutions. The first one would be to approve the resolution um, adopting a capital improvement plan and providing preliminary approval for the issuance of bonds there under. I'll make a motion to that effect. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. -oh. And we need the next and resolution. Yeah, the second resolution is if the council so chooses, as Mark talked about earlier. I mean, if do we want if we want to go ahead and move forward and set the uh, the pre-sale date for October 6, 2014, and so that would be a resolution providing for the sale or pre-sale of four million eight hundred ninety-five million in capital improvement plan bond series 2014 B. Four hundred four million eight hundred ninety-five thousand. Yes, I say that wrong. Yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> They're not doing 400 million. We'd be oh, yeah, in yeah, big yeah, trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think let's, that would fly. Let's do your number, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five all. Okay, now we're moving to the business items. Accepting a quote for asbestos abatement for the Gillespie property at 1420 Westwood Drive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. This is the... Uh, Final step in uh, doing the demolition of the structures on the Gillespie property, which is donated to the city uh, for a park purpose. Um, we did have uh, an asbestos report uh, performed and conducted. That report was set up, sent out uh, to three hazardous materials uh, companies, um, as well as the demo contractor, uh, Pride Construction and Excavating, uh, to receive quotes on removing the hazardous, hazardous materials um, from that structure. Uh, there's uh, two parts to this quote and, and uh, action this evening. Um, as you will see as part of the staff report and the actual asbestos report, um, there is some attic insulation um, that can be um, quite costly for uh, the abatement companies to remove. Um, that was why Pride Construction and Excavating was uh, uh, sent the quote to see if it was something they could possibly do. Um, they said it was. Um, given that they're doing the demolition, they'd have to get a special liner for a dumpster to get it hauled off site. But um, their quoted cost on removing that uh, insulation is significantly less, as you can see, um, than the other two contractors that submitted quote. Um, the pride construction and excavating is $700, so that would be added on to his um, contract if it's uh, chosen by the council for the demo. Um, and then two companies uh, did submit quotes for the uh, hazardous waste uh, removal, um, the low, low quote being Envirobate at $4,085. Uh, so the recommended action or motion this evening would be a resolution accepting a quote for pride construction and excavating for the removal of the attic installation, and then the quote for Envirobate for the removal of the hazardous materials for the Gillespie property at 1420 Westwood Drive. Any questions? Yeah, first of all, the, uh, the testing that was done, that, just to clarify, I believe I've seen someplace, that did uh, end up costing us seven fifty. is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Much cheaper than we had originally had looked at one mm -hmm. time. Uh, the other question I have is uh, uh, on the tile and the other things that are included in for EnviroBait, uh, that has to be a separate, that can't be done by, that has to be a separate issue. Okay. I know, uh, no, that's, that's fine. I'm, I'm very familiar with, with their operation. That sounds very fair. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Um, I'm gonna abstain from this because Pride Construction is a distant relative. Okay. I'll make a motion to go ahead and proceed with the pride construction on the, I guess it would be the insulation part and bait on the hazardous waste I'll material. Second. I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 It's a 4 0. At one abstention. Okay, next is the approving agreement for professional engineering services with Bolton and Menk for water treatment plant and water main. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to make a few comments, and then Brian may make a few comments. And we also have uh, Seth Peterson here from Bolton Mink. Uh, in your packet is a uh, 
a bunch of materials related to the professional services uh, with Bolton and Mank. Um, it has the agreement there, and then it also has uh, one uh, exhibit with the uh, actual agreement that kind of talks about um, all the different phases, and the, at the end of the agreement, it also talks about um, some estimate, estimated fees for kind of the major task items. They don't all quite line up based on the uh, items in the um, addendum, or I'm sorry, in the uh, exhibit, but they're there if you kind of go through it. Uh, they've just kind of quantified most of the work that's in that exhibit um, into, so I think it's six categories. And so uh, with that, I may turn it over, to, I will turn it over to Brian. Uh, the only, I do have one uh, thing I'd like to comment on before we uh, uh, make a vote. I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add, Brian. Um, the only thing I was gonna just give an update on the, the project, and maybe, I don't know if Seth was gonna talk about this too, is we did see the, uh, the draft, uh, I think it's the IUP and project priority list comes out, and we, we are on the list, so that's, <laughs> so that's a good thing. We're, we're, we're there, so it's, it's moving forward. So I think that was the, uh, one thing I was going to update on her. And I was going to point out that even if we had gone through the process that earlier, we would still be doing this at this time. If we wanted to use probably PFA dollars Correct. together, because their dollars so we, would be. We technically haven't lost any time by delaying our decision until the time that we did. We would not have been constructed this summer. Not, Some people seem to think yeah, that even the dollars. original presentation would have had a construction it would not have because of the PFA funding you had to get on the list those funds aren't available until now correct yeah, yeah. Uh, actually right now all it is is the draft list that just right. came out uh, two weeks ago a week and a half ago and so Minitrista made the fundable range so that's a that's a big deal because that now uh, the so city is now no eligible way. for those low interest loan dollars and they're quite low I mean interest rates are um, it, you won't be able to lock in until you get much farther along. You have to take bids, but um, they're at historically low uh, right now for the Public Facilities Authority. So it's a, it's a great program to be in. Okay. I don't know if you had any other comments, Seth. I just have. I, I didn't. Um, I'll take any comments or questions from, from staff or, or well, from the council. The only real, I think, change that I would like to make, it, and I apologize for the late hour here on, on doing this, even though it's been in the packet already, is that under the compensation for services, I mean, there's, it says it's a lump sum of 305000 and we talked a little bit about this on the phone. We had a conference call between uh, Mr. Grimm and uh, Seth Peterson and myself, I don't know if it was Thursday, I believe, last week, Thursday, yeah. And the one change that I would like to see um, under uh, the fees section, it's section three, that would show up on page 86 in your packet. That's page two of 12 of the agreement. Um, it says uh, compensate the consultant in a lump sum fee of 305,000. I would like to change that language to say an hourly not to exceed 305,000 versus the lump sum. That's kind of been our standard mm -hmm. operating procedure here. So, um, you know, costs could escalate. Um, hopefully they won't, but you just never know, especially in a project this size. So. Um, after our conversation with Seth last Thursday, you know they're they're going to bill us on a regular basis as they do the work. There's not going to be a three hundred five thousand lump sum payment due at any time, even though it says lump sum. That's not what their intention were uh, was in this. But again, my preference would be to maybe have that be an hourly, not to exceed three hundred five thousand. I don't know if that's uh, agreeable to Bolton and Mank or not, but if it, yeah, we can definitely do that. This okay. is typically on projects like this, we'll do the lump sum or um, uh, a fixed fee uh, a type of uh, project like this, but if staff and council's more uh, comfortable with an hourly not to exceed, we can definitely do that also. Okay. And I'd like to point out that this is significantly lower than what we were looking at previously for engineering fee, preliminary engineering fee. You know, that brings up a point. I, after reading and listening to and having many phone calls about this project, this water treatment project that's going to cost us $5 million. The engineering fees on that from WSB were going to be like close to 10%. Uh, and, and, all I, you know, and again, not only did I read it in the paper everywhere, it's $5 million. And the reason I'm saying that is because I had a number of calls that come in and said, why would you vote for something for $16 million when you can get it done for five? So that's why it was 
very frustrating and inaccurate. Now on the design fees, WSB had close to 10%. If this 305,000 is for the 16 million, no, it's not. It's it's only so like it's, the first two. So it's, in the bottom five, line, when everything is right? done, yeah, design you're looking fees at about five percent. Yeah, design fees are estimated right around five percent, which is like this. half of what WSB would have been. Correct. Is that correct? That's correct. That's what I thought. Thank you. So we need to approve the agreement with that change yep with the one change if uh council is agreeable the hourly not to exceed hourly and the total amount to okay any other questions i'll entertain a motion i'll make a motion to approve the uh total primary design three hundred five thousand, not to exceed i'll second it all those in favor aye aye, aye. five all Okay, next is administrative. Thank you, Thank you Thank so you, much, Seth. If you want, you can just, I give you, I can either resend them or if you just want to cross out the lump sum and put hourly not to exceed them. And we can initial it. To we'll let you initial, initial it and send it off to us. We'll be just Sounds like a good plan. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, very much. you, Seth. Okay, administrative items. I saw well in here. Let me find it. Oh, I wish Gary was here. You dug a well? No, no. No, no, he didn't dig 5, 000, it. I think it was 5,000. I have to find it. Yeah. I thought I highlighted it, but it didn't come up. It's on the bottom of page 100. Yeah, I think it's 4,600 and something. Or, no, that's electric utilities. Okay, Don Stadola, 4,604.50. New well for old public works building. What is that? Oh, well, we did have a well for, that failed that provides water to the, the buildings over here, this building and the um, I think part of this building too, so. Okay, I'm confused. Wasn't there a well drilled in 2009, 2010 for this campus? Is that the one that failed? I'm not sure if that's the one that failed. I do know that there was a well failure here. If if you so desire, Mayor, I think I will. Uh, well, it's mm -hmm. surprising to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there another, something else going, you know? No, I just think there was something that happened to the actual unit itself that had to be pulled and replaced. Could you check it out and get back to us? I sure, sure, certainly can. Okay. I would like that. That's just the one sitting right back here. I believe so. Right here. Yep. Okay. Oh, that's, that's fairly new. I think there I think there's multiple wells on this I process. think so. Yeah, I don't I think, think it's a new, new one. one. I mean I'm not 100% pretty sure. sure. It's yeah. An old one, Madam Mayor, members of the council, I believe it was the one right next to the old public works building. I saw the well company out working right. on that. I think that's so why it's, it's identified. So it's not the well for this yes. building. I believe it's for the old public works building which is right next to the building there. Cuz I thought didn't they build a pretty substantial well when they did this project? Yeah. Over there. Over there, I believe, but not over okay. here. So that's just for the police building? Or I don't know. Well, the, there's a separate, I believe there's a separate well over for the police building. They have Correct. their own well. There's, a, there's an old well for the public works building. I'm pretty sure City Hall has another Correct. well when City Hall was built. Okay. That sounds correct. So there's three wells on the campus. Mm -hmm. Okay. And those are like residential size wells? Is that why we have so many? That could be. I, this was probably put in a long time ago. I mean, I think this was with the original. I think that originally was the quote city hall at one point in time before this building was built. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think anybody was here then, but I think that's the history okay. of it. Yeah, it just was interesting. Any other questions about the claims? On the claims. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. I've noticed that in the month, this last month, on the, uh, there's been uh, $110,000 paid to WSB. Is there a way to know what that breakdown is or what it went for? I mean, I noticed there's 34000 to Woodland Cove yep. on one part, 30000 on Kings Point. Yeah, Councilmember. Um, when you get a, 
Is there a way to see what we're getting for that? There's a couple different things that I want to point out. Uh, Councilmember Christensen. Mm -hmm. And then Woodland Cove, let me add one more thing here. Uh, I, I know that this is being passed through Correct. to the developer. Correct. Yes, yep. Well, I'm glad I'm not the developer. It scared the hell out of me. <laughs> so, yeah, so the uh, anything that has an asterisk by it, if you look on the far right there in front of, like, on Woodland Cove, um, you know, Kings Point Road, you know, actually, I'm just going to bring that up under staff reports. I mean, they're, the Woodland Cove group or the Carlson group is paying for the majority of that, you know, for, through, you know, assessments and stuff. The roundabout is the same way. Um, Woodland Cove second edition. So any of those items that have an asterisk are, they usually are to what's called the 801 fund. If you look on the far left too, okay. as far as the G801, you know, sort of, sort of our land use fund or any type of land use type items. So, so a lot of the items there, I mean, you can see the 34,000, the 30,000 are, are reimbursable that then, you know, a developer or a land use uh, participant or applicant, I guess is the right term, um, pays for. So that's, if that. I would just think if, if, if I was Woodland Cove, I would say, what am I getting for that? I mean, mm -hmm. what, what, what's the Well, they agreed to it. Yeah, that? they yeah, agreed to it. I know it's kind of like scary, but what I mean, do, do we tell them what they're getting for that? Yeah, they get a copy sure. of the invoices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the invoices it's of absolutely. what they're getting. Yeah, yeah, it's just what we approved here, you know, for not to exceed right. hourly, you know, on the water project. It's the same type of thing. It's an hourly rate, you know, based on the fee schedule of whoever is working, what type of position. So that's... They actually, when they make their land use application, we get a, a significant deposit. We, we already have the money mm -hmm. because that's required as part of the land use application. Our fee structure is set as such to cover I know we're not, costs. the city's not paying for it. I know that. It's just that the developer, I guess, mm -hmm. concerned that if they're happy with what they're being paid. I mean, it seems like a lot of money, but well, I, think they I were, know they're paying for it. Because I believe they signed it, so signed the contract yeah. or so. Yeah. I assume they are. Okay. okay. And I, I had one other comment. On page 101, uh, there's two checks, one to me and one to my husband, and I don't want you to write those checks. Uh, we feel terrible that we're not going to be able to serve as election judges, but because of the political climate, we don't want to risk the election being jeopardized by serving as election judges, even though I'm not running. So I, we do not want to accept that money. Okay, we'll make a note of that to our Floyd those, out Floyd those yes. checks. Thank you. We'll Anything else? Okay, so I'll entertain a motion to approve the claims. I'll make a motion to approve the claims. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Oh. Okay, council reports. Uh, Northwest League hasn't started up again. Uh, Police Communications Committee, we haven't had a meeting. We did have a meeting with Rick Weibel. Correct. Um, that went well. Um, nothing terribly exciting, just kind of a status. Oh, we have new bicycles. They suggested that we get bicycle racks, and so we have new bicycle racks outside for those of you who would like to ride your bike to the city council meetings. Um, did you want to add anything to our? Nope, I think you covered our, it. And then um, uh, Minnehaha Creek Watershed District, we have encouraged them to film, uh, videotape their meetings, and uh, we hope that they plan on doing that. And then uh, the Water Treatment Subcommittee is no longer um, in action. That was just to do the survey. Mark? Uh, the only <clears throat> comment I have is uh, I've had some more complaints from residents as far as, excuse me, as far as the roundabout. A um, couple of them actually asked if, if it would help to uh, email, mail, send letters to MnDOT. Um, I talked to Mark Erickson this afternoon about it. He was going to check with MnDOT to see if they had um, any indication of that they may change, especially one of the residents was from out east, and he said he's, he's real, very, very familiar with roundabouts, and he's never seen one that strike this way. Right, I've had and people say that too. that's what's, it's really confusing people that you go from one, you know, basically two lanes to four lanes, back to two again, and I've living by it I've seen some interesting things happen there that do not happen in the roundabout that's just west of us on County Road 10. It seems like the two lanes are really confusing people. People try and get around people on the right hand side and then they're trying to merge back in and everybody slams on the brakes and it just seems really an odd configuration. I mean I've seen roundabouts that are two lane this way but normally the inside lane is strictly for going around the circle. It's not a through lane. Yeah, um, I, I think that right lane, and it's not marked properly. I've 
I drive that way yeah. sometimes as well. I think that right lane is intended that once there is there are a lot of houses in there, that's just going to be strictly for the people who are actually turning into the Woodland Cove from 7 going out. Yeah, so I don't know if they'll... But in the meantime, it is confusing. Right. Mark said, uh, I think if I remember right, he said in Hugo they had the same situation, and actually they uh, abandoned one of the lanes temporary um, until traffic, you know, until the traffic, or, or am I mistaken, Paul? Well, maybe I can add a little light in it. It was in Forest Lake. Or Forest Lake. It's okay. on a trunk highway system and it's a low speed uh, corridor in both directions. Uh, it was a trunk highway and a county state highway, and then there was a minor leg for a city roadway. And what we ended up finding out once it was in operation, this is not uh, unusual when you open a roundabout. Um, you start to look at what the driver's behavior is in those and see if there's some other operational things that you can change to make it uh, perform better. The one in Forest Lake, they restriped it to be a single lane uh, and be primarily because uh, they started getting a lot of side impact crashes. Usually that's a result of people are being too aggressive as they're approaching that um, roundabout. And um, also some unfamiliarity with driving a two-lane roundabout. The simplest way to explain the two-lane roundabouts is if you're in the left lane, you go straight or left. If you're in the right lane, you go straight or right. It's fairly simple. This one, on the striping plan, I'm looking at it now, is striped that way. So, at least in the plan, I, I didn't observe it in the field. Um, I guess I didn't look at the pavement markings myself. Uh, there are some new, um, both MnDOT and I think some of the counties are looking at some directional arrows, payment messages, and signing that's not so confusing. Uh, the one in Forest Lake, we striped that one um, so that it just had a typical through and right turn arrow sign on it rather than having the hook going around the island. That hook seems to confuse people. Uh, sometimes you would see people take a left and go the wrong way in the roundabout not knowing they had to go around the island. So it did, that was in a heavy downtown uh, situation when you have 20,000 vehicles a day, northbound, southbound, and westbound. So uh, this was, uh, the one thing that complicates a roundabout on a trunk highway that's higher speed is the aggressiveness people have and not slowing down enough. Um, so it is one of those that's a behavioral thing. Sometimes we ask the state patrol to patrol it uh, well, to make people behave is one way to do that. I've seen Washington County do that in another roundabout. Um, but it does take a little time for people to get used to them. It is uh, one of those things where we've got to talk to MnDOT and ask if they've got any complaints or um, if they have any observations of their own. Um, Mark and I were talking about this earlier too. They can set up cameras and see what people are doing in the roundabout to try to make some corrections. I think part of the problem is the way you described that it's supposed to work makes sense in theory, but it is a road that goes from, is it 50 to 50? And so the section where there are two cars trying to get going straight, if they end up going straight, they just there's not much space for them to get together. And they're trying to get going back to that 50. Yeah, and that's right, that's one of the things I mean by their people being too aggressive yeah. in them. They're supposed to slow down to about 15 miles an hour through the roundabout. That's also why they have short deceleration and short acceleration lanes. Uh, unlike a turn lane, which might have a 500-foot uh, turn lane for that slowing down. Or for, they used to have acceleration lanes or doing away with those. But that's the reason for it. The speed is 15 miles an hour, which it should be maintained through the roundabout uh, and on approach. And people want to be a little more aggressive. I've seen people actually use the roundabout on the inside lane to bypass slower traffic on the right. Uh, that's a behavior you, you, you want to discourage. It's dangerous. Um, I've actually seen people cut across the truck aprons on these roundabouts to try to short circuit the roundabout. So there is a learning experience. Sometimes it takes a little bit of patrol time. Uh, but I also would think MnDOT would, could set up a camera if we requested it and try to see if there's some operational issues we need to take a look at. Yeah, it, it doesn't, doesn't seem to be getting better. And I was going to say it's funny you mention that, but it's not funny. It's kind of ironic when you said about because of the left hand turn arrow. I came into it about when was it this spring and as I was coming into it I was westbound on 7 I was coming into it I noticed a vehicle coming up 11 it got to the roundabout and it took a left so now it's going 
westbound and eastbound lane. And I'm like, oh my God, somebody's going to get hurt here. The car started pulling out, and I thought, who in the world would do something like that? I get through the roundabout. It gets down the road a block. It puts a left-hand cert- left hand signal on, and it goes in my driveway. And it's, it's my elderly father-in-law. And he just said, the sign said left. So he went left. So that scares me a little bit that that's what's actually happening. It's, it, it's ironic that you said that. And I watched him do that. And I called my wife and I said, is your dad here? And she says, well, he just left. I said, you may want to talk to him because I said, this could have been serious. I said, he could have got killed or killed somebody there. Yeah, there are some, also some educational tools. Maybe I can get some links that we can, if we can get them on our website or put some links on the website that can show it's, it's an educational tool so people know how they're supposed to drive these two-lane roundabouts. There is a learning curve on them. Um, in the particular intersection I mentioned in Forest Lake, there were some severe crashes in those that intersection. And um, they did initially have more crashes, but there were very minor crashes and side impacts. And I think they just got a, not, a larger number of them because people were just getting too aggressive in them. And those were 30 mile an hour speed limits there. Here you're going from 50 and slowing down to 15 and going back to 50. Hmm. Yeah. Well, could we show that video at a council meeting? Oh, yeah. Sure. We can get that. Why don't we show we'll it at that. our next council meeting? That way we know it's mm-hmm. at least on YouTube. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. Like I say, it would be interesting to see if MnDOT will because as a person that moves heavy equipment, you know, semi, you cannot go through that roundabout with staying in, a, in one lane unless you're and crawled up on the center island. I mean, and, it's, and it's not the intent. Actually, right. when there's a semi going through, they're allowed to use both lanes plus the truck aid. Well, tell, tell the people that are next to you. And right. they're supposed to yield. Yeah, but they, they don't. They are supposed they to yield to that right. semi. I saw one semi one day that a car and them got together. And the only way I can do it is, and I know people don't like it, but when you go into it, you have to drive down the center. That's because if you do. don't, people will go around you on the right-hand side and there's going to be a problem, and I don't want to have accidents. And what you did, what you described, what you do, is exactly what you should do. You should take that. You should take that lane up, and and not because you you have all no. lanes when you're in that. Moment. No, and but people don't get that when they honk at you and they they uh, give you the number one flag because they don't get that part of it. I mean, it's just we'll get that. We'll get a link to the mm-hmm. one of the videos, a couple of videos mm-hmm. to give as an educational tool. And and like I say, I'm just trying to find out if MnDOT's flexible. I don't want these residents to waste their time emailing and writing letters to MnDOT if it's a waste of time. And that's that's why I wanted to talk about it a little bit. There is a one thing I should mention too is that when you're engineering these, it's unbelievable the scrutiny that these things go through um, through the different functional groups at MnDOT. It can take a year or more to get a roundabout approved. Uh, just through their functional groups, and it's um, they do have a fast track program. I think the Forest Lake one went through the fast track program in just over a year, um, and, and it functioned fine up to a point. But I think the the driver behavior really starts to play into it. And I do know Washington County was also having problems with a roundabout on high speed corridors, and they also restrike theirs. So that in one of the, I think it's right, the right hand lane, you can only go right. So you cannot go straight through in the right, in the right hand lane anymore. That helps solve that issue too. They had people in the right hand lane that were trying to go around the roundabout to the left and they'd have crashes for the person trying to go straight. Mm-hmm. So, so they do, the two lane roundabouts are a little more complicated, but I'll get a tool on the website for it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Madam Mayor, members of council, if I could just make a comment uh, regarding this because uh, uh, obviously as the public safety department we deal with this issue every day and I think uh, uh, Paul is absolutely right, there is a learning curve and I think uh, we've, we're far enough beyond when this roundabout has opened to know that that's probably about as good as it's going to get. Um, we've done a number of things, uh, putting articles from MnDOT on the use of roundabouts, two-lane roundabouts on our <coughs> crime fighter on the website. And I think we should continue to do that. I think education is very important. Um, but I think uh, I live west, so I come through, I have the luxury of coming through three roundabouts every day to and from work. And uh, 
I think part of the issue is all those roundabouts are fairly new, Highway 25 and Highway 7, 10 and 7, and then our, ours is the newest. But they're all relatively new. And so it really uh, threw me for a loop when ours opened and it was striped completely different than the two just immediately west of us. And I think, in a nutshell, that is really the biggest issue we have because you essentially have a two-lane highway that comes into a four-lane roundabout back to a two-lane highway. And so um, that is, in a nutshell, what is causing the confusion. And I think I, too, have seen people use that as a, a passing lane for slowing traffic or slower traffic, which certainly is not appropriate. Um, we get a lot of complaints about, really, it's about the signage and about the stripes because it's just plain causing confusion. And so I think uh, the message going forward, whether it's from engineering or us or together, is we'd really like to see that thing restriped. I think if they just remove the stripe, it might be a little bit wider lanes, but nonetheless, it appears to be one lane, single lane going through. I think that would really resolve the vast majority of our issues. So, um, and then I just wanna touch on the enforcement piece. We sit there a lot. Um, in that roundabout for, for various reasons. And I know the, uh, the state patrol sits there quite a bit as well. I saw them sitting there earlier today. Um, and it's, it's interesting because the drivers uh, are a lot less aggressive certainly when the police are sitting there, but it seems as though half hour later, they're right back to the same thing. Um, and so while that does help, none of us can provide 24 seven um, enforcement. And so I think uh, if we can get those stripes removed, that would probably be the best bet. Okay, Arlene, you're next. Um, we're scheduling of a Parks Commission meeting, but we did not have a quorum, so we're going to have one next week. Okay, that's about it. Bob? Yeah, I have just a couple of things. One, uh, Monday, September 15th, at 6.30, there was scheduled a WCC meeting at Ellen Oma's of which you and I were to attend. And uh, currently that is in the process of trying to be rescheduled so we can attend. That's very important, I think, because there will also be the mayor mound mm -hmm. uh, and the mayor of Spring, Spring Park. Park. So uh, we're currently trying to get that rescheduled. Uh, the second thing is, is I went to the St. Bonnie Fire Advisory Committee meeting this last week. That was the best meeting I've ever gone to. We were there, and the reason I say that is because Shane Weber, the fire chief, the assistant fire chief, and one of the council members of St. Bonnie, they said, you know, Bob, St. Bonnie and Minatrista, this is the best working relationship we have ever had with Minatrista. And for that, I would like to thank Mr. Paul Falls. Uh, the comments between working relationship between St. Bonnie and Minatrista, both with the fire department and our police department. It was kind of fun sitting in that meeting with everybody and having somebody come out and say, working relationship with Minatrist is the best it's ever been. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Okay, Tyler. I just have one request, probably for the Loeffler guys back, out back, but could we get the time on both of these to match up? I don't know if you're on the Citrix. Mm -hmm. Mine both say 811. It's just my computer. No, no yours says no, 9 11. They like the time, the other one mm -hmm. isn't. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. Is, this just, is the bottom one local? I'm not sure. Find we'll find out. I'll find out about mm -hmm. the time on that. You so, bet. Yeah, mine match. Mm -hmm. You got one in Eastern time and one in Central? or? Maybe I can. No, need administrator password. All right. Well, I'll, I'll check about it. I think our <coughs> network administrator visit is scheduled for this week. So. Mm -hmm. Staff reports. I don't know if anybody else. I have a couple of things. Um, just one is an FYI. Um, I will be, and I'm going to actually have uh, Brian Grimm help me this year um, in our labor negotiations. Labor negotiations. We have two contracts up at the end of this calendar year. Both our police uh, officers union and police supervisors union, and we have. Um, Meeting scheduled this week. This is the, the first meeting is just to listen to what they want to have you know, as part of a contract. So we're not really negotiating anything this week. We're just listening. So kind of FYI that this is happening and I'll probably be end up scheduling a meeting with personnel committee members sometime in the next few weeks to kind of discuss strategies based on it. exactly what it is that they're after in the, an upcoming contract for both <laughs> units. Uh, and then the other thing is, and uh, 
Uh, Paul Hornby is aware of this, and I've had him do a little uh, work on this. But I had a resident who lives over on Loring Drive, and he came in, I would say, about, it was shortly after the last council meeting. So, um, And he was very impressed with the wall that was constructed and, and loves it. The only thing he doesn't love is the cyclone fence that's on top. He hates looking at it. So he actually... Um, asked if there was something that we can do about even replacing that with a black colored fence versus the whatever it's the, the I don't know if it's orange but it's, it's orange. Gal galvanized galvanized oh, yeah. galvanized yeah galvanized uh, aluminum or steel or whatever it is so and he even offered to pay for it so we're investigating the cost um, obviously this man has uh, enough wherewithal to be able to make an offer like that and I told him very much appreciated it but I, I would get back to him but um, I don't think he wants to wake up every day and look out his window and see that beautiful wall with a in his words a crummy cyclone fence on top of it so he just kind of would like to see that fence go away so I we're going to investigate those costs and then if uh, the council's okay with um, we can certainly talk about it at the next meeting um, trying to still maybe deal with it this year I know um, Mr. Hornby, contact uh, uh, Mr. Valak today to kind of get some information on what it would take to, to do who his vendor was, that kind of stuff. So, mm -hmm. so just an FYI right, right now, but I just know that that offer has been made because he was pretty adamant about not looking at that cyclone fence. Any color other than that would be preferable to him. So, mm -hmm. go ahead, go ahead, well, Brian. I just had one um, other quick more FYI for a agenda item at the next um, work session. Um, you know, we talked last summer at the beginning of the Kings Point Road project as far as there's some properties along, you know, the majority of it's going to be paid through our, you know, bonding process. You know, we did the 2013 B bonds last year for the Kings Point and start collecting assessments in 2015 through, you know, the Woodland Cove Carlson Group, but there is some of the parcels that are adjacent to the, the project and I guess we'll want to discuss with council as far as what their feelings are. I think it's more for the water Stubbins, Stubbins, is that correct, Paul? And, correct. And um, I guess more just present some options and, and talk about that at the work session because we will um, need to finalize that project and have you know the assessment rule and whether it's just the Carlson Group or whether there's other properties or I guess that's council's decision. You know, I and thought we discussed this last year. We did last summer, but I think we more because we knew we were going to assess at the end of the project. We sort of left it open as far as what to do. I mean, I think we talked about whether. Deferring assessment. We'll have options to, for yeah, talking a number of options for I thought we had talked consider. about deferring the assessment until the properties were developed. I thought we voted on it. It was discussed. I don't know yeah. if there was official vote, but the, that discussion was had. That is correct. Yeah, that, that, that was, was the, the yes. what we had yeah, about doing. Yeah, because I think we had talked about it, and it, we, we were told that until the assessment, till the end. Is that yeah, what we're right. That's, that's, that's what we're asking. Right. I think right. that's mm -hmm. kind of what we had. Yeah, so you know. we can maybe have a brief sure. discussion at the next work section or for. Sure. Uh, and as far as that. Because I know a lot of those homeowners don't plan on hooking into it. Right. Currently. So when. We just want to make sure that stayed on, on yeah. process and then it's right. That's. We just have a timeline we're trying to meet. And okay. so I think uh, the work session at the ahead of the next council meeting will be. So uh, the you time want to, to get on the September uh, 15th? 15th. Correct. Yep. Okay. Be able to give you all the options available for you to decide on how to yep. kind of finalize yeah, the project. Yeah, because Tyler like wasn't here. Bob, you were here when we talked about it, weren't you? Mm -hmm. I believe so, yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think just Tyler. Okay. Anybody have anything else? One, one quick thing when you brought up Kings Point Road. There was something I had actually three residents of Kings Point Road. They were curious why the speed limit went from 40 to 30. I thought I called you on this one. Well, you did. Okay. okay. I'm just, I just wanted to, to right. give information. I was like, for, wait a sec, maybe I just yeah, imagine no. calling you. So, so people that live there, they understand what happened. Okay. Um, Mark Erickson explained it very well, that basically the road had to be updated to today, today's standards. Correct. And with the curves down by the lift station and the hills and stuff, it didn't meet, meet the spec for a 40-mile-an-hour road anymore. Correct. So that's why it was set as changed. Yeah. And I think the, the timing of it was they finished putting on the lift right. and they went in and changed right. the sign. So right. we didn't, police didn't, we didn't call them and say, hey, time to change the signs. Yeah. They just, right. it's part of their process. They knew they had to do it. Right. Just so people, if, if they're well, they'll curious. Like that. Well, well actually, these three individuals didn't. They were concerned that it went from 
40 to 30. They're the aggressive oh, drivers that are, well, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> but that are screwing up the roundabout. So. Most often we get complaints. Yeah. Right, right. But just for information, so yeah. if, if somebody does ask anybody, that's what was the explanation, is that's what the road yeah. was designed for, was a 30 mile an hour road. Right. So. And now it is. Now yeah. it is. Okay, any other items? No, nope. no, Mayor, we don't. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. No second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 This meeting is adjourned. So let me, he dropped by signed copies from them. So let me make a notation on there about the hourly not to exceed. He said that was fine.